memory lane on that fateful day, let's welcome the parliamentary candidate for that by-election and on whose doorstep the violence began. Mr. Delali Brempon is here with us. Thank you very much, sir. From the 20, the Honorable Sam Nati George. Nime, His Excellency, the incoming President of the Republic of Ghana, John Dramani Mahama, the national executives of our party led by Chairman of Oswampo, for regional executives led by Chairman Adekoka, my colleague members of parliament, comrades, party members, the rep of the Russian embassy with us present, all protocols observed. A.E. Saman told us that despots are elected and deposed. Laws are passed and repealed. Nations rise and fall, but individual liberties are eternal. The death of a colleague in parliament and someone I considered a big brother, Honorable Emmanuel Boachie Jaco, led to a by-election in the Ayawasu West Wagon constituency on the 31st of January 2019. What should have been a simple democratic event turned out to be a bloodbath that will be remembered as one of the darkest days in the political history of our country. The grounds upon which we stand today were desecrated and defiled by sheer brutality and wickedness of a few bloodthirsty individuals hiding behind the veil of state security. These are cowards who, but for the uniforms they adorned and the weapons they brandished, will tremble at their knees at the sight of many who had come out that fateful day to cast their ballots. What started for me at 6.30 a.m. in front of Legon Hall on the University of Ghana campus as a routine electoral assignment, as an accredited election monitor coordinating my colleague MPs who were going to be monitoring the election, quickly became a nightmare that has left me and my colleagues over there, uh, 26 of them, scarred for life. As I Ishtinis famously stated, be assured, fellow citizens, that in a democracy, it is the laws that guard the person of the citizen and the constitution of the state, whereas the despot and the oligarchs find their protection in suspicion and in the use of armed guards. On the 31st of January 2019, we saw the despotic government of Nana Dankwa Kufuado and his henchmen use hired armed guards attired in national security apparel and holding weapons purchased with our taxpayer money for our protection as citizens commenced their rampage by attacking our deputy national women organizer, Mami Ifwa Sechiado, and claiming they had arrested her for taking pictures. May I ask, fellow citizens, who, when engaged in lawful exercise, takes offense that their pictures or videos are being taken? It is only those who are guilty of committing crimes against humanity who seek to cover their actions that get offended. These hoodlums did not stop there. They proceeded like a pack of rabid dogs to the residence of a parliamentary candidate at the time, Delali Brimpong, with only one aim in mind, to ransack and pillage his house. When they were stopped by party faithful at the residence, they resorted to the standard modus operandi of despots, the use of brutal force. They unleashed an unrelenting volley of bullets into the crowd of unarmed Ghanaian citizens, injuring and maiming comrades and citizens of this republic, some of whom are present here today. They had only one aim, to cause as much human damage as possible. They sought to sow the seeds of fear into us and to cower us using brute force. But as Philip Zambrado said in his book, The Lucifer Effect, fear is the state psychological weapon of choice to frighten citizens into sacrificing their basic freedoms and the rule of law protections in exchange for the security promised by their all-powerful government. We, however, refused to be frightened. And in the face of their terror, we, we stood as ordinary citizens with one aim on that memorable day, to exercise our franchise. We spoke truth to authority. We challenged them with the convictions of our hearts, even at the peril of our lives. 
As George Orwell says, the spotty governments can stand moral force till cows come home, but what they fear is physical force, and we will meet them with physical force if they come again. <laughs> Their only resort when we spoke truth to authority was to inflict further violence on us. For speaking truth to authority and cautioning these morading hoodlums who were sanctioned agents of our national despots, Nanado Dankwa Kufuado, I was physically attacked by two of these cowards. One, Mohammed Suleimana, who until his so-called recruitment into the national security apparatus of our country in 2018, was the NPP's youth organizer in the Nanton constituency, was the coward who thought assaulting me would shut me up. He didn't know me well. He rather gave me a voice. He gave a voice to millions of well-meaning Ghanaians to speak our collective truth to power. Our spirits remain unbroken and our resolve as strong as ever to seek justice. The pressure of Ghanaians compelled the chief despot, Nana Dodankwa Kufado, to set up a commission of inquiry, the Emil Short Commission. He and his cabal expected that that commission would deliver a whitewash of the events. They were wrong. We appeared before the commission and told the truth as we knew it and saw it and we backed it by irrefutable evidence. Forensic tests by the commission and site visits corroborated our story and exposed the lies of the national security setup. The dysfunction in our national security architecture that has been orchestrated by Nanado Danko Akufuado was put on display for all to see. We heard how hoodlums were given masks to protect them from mosquito bites. We saw how poorly trained party foot soldiers were given weapons like toffees and sent out to wreak havoc on unarmed citizens of this republic after only three weeks of training on how to use a walkie-talkie and how to read a map. Mr. President, fellow citizens gathered here, the commission revealed to all and sundry that the sad events of January 31st, 2019 were premeditated, cold, and calculated attempts to cause mayhem and inflict maximum damage on members of the NDC. Unfortunately for them, what they do not know is that as Charles Fourier says, despot preferred the friendship of dogs who unjustly mistreated and debased still love the men who serve them. We are not dogs, we are lions. And because we are lions, we will not relent in our fight back. We will fight back and achieve justice, one way or the other. The Emil Short Commission issued their report and indicted extensively the president and his dysfunctional appointments to the national security apparatus and the individuals involved and identified in the unfortunate incident of 31st January 19, 2019. The president has roundly rejected the findings of the commission. One thing we will tell the president is that he has become prosecution, jury, and judge in his own court. On the basis of this, Mr. Incoming President John Dramani Mahama, myself and the NDC, myself and the NDC will next week be filing a lawsuit against His Excellency Nanado Dankwe Kufuado to challenge the findings of the white paper the white paper that has been issued and challenge the basis for that white paper and the rubbishing of the Michelle's commission. And we call on Excellency Nanado Dankwa Kufuado, the chief despot of the Republic, to immediately give life to the recommendations of the Emil Short Commission. No matter how long the journey to justice will be, we know that we will secure justice one day, someday, very soon and that John Dramani Mahama as the president of this republic. As we mark the first anniversary of the dastardly acts that occurred in, the, in this vicinity a year ago, we are minded by the elections ahead of us in December 2020, and we say never again. Never again should citizens of this republic be subjected to the violent proclivities of those in power. Never again should the individual liberties of citizens be unjustly curtailed by supposed state actors. Never again should our rights to exercise the democratic franchise in an election be curtailed by cold, premeditated violence. Let those who parade the corridors of power today in the Flagstaff House know one thing, that the power of the people is greater than the people in power. God bless our homeland and help us to resist oppressors' rule. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Honorable Member of Parliament for the Ningo Pram Pram constituency, the Honorable Sam Nate George. Indeed, we will resist oppressors' rule. I'm sure that you all want to go back again and watch events of that day. We have some compiled videos for you, so if you turn towards the screen, I'm sure that you can bring those memories back and know exactly why we are here 
this morning.
Charlie, right now they are on the point the gun come here.
Good morning. I'm told I can only do 15 minutes. I'll do my best. Your Excellency, the former President of the Republic of Ghana, uh, all protocols observed, and then uh, my other colleagues who are supposed to be speaking, uh, and the organization that organized this program. Thank you for inviting me. And probably I accepted to speak here because of the victims. And whilst the images were being beamed, the man who has his leg, who, had, who suffered the most of the carnage, I realized he couldn't watch himself in the back of the truck. And that speaks volumes. And so before I highlight or go straight to what I have to discuss, I would, I would urge that uh, probably civil society, Your Excellency, the former president, if Ghanaian hospitals cannot treat him, I think he should be flown outside the country and be treated so he doesn't get amputated. He's a young man and we can't afford to have our young men going through this. And so I would appeal to you. I would start my, conver my conversation with the day the incident happened. My office is not too far away from here. And usually when security incidents happen, you would have too many of the media houses calling me to talk. And it was right around nine, eight, nine, and uh, the calls started coming. I didn't know what was going on. I knew there was just an ordinary by-election. So I picked that of TV3. And immediately they told me they had to speak to me via Skype. And I said, what was it? And they started beaming images of probably a scene that looked like a war zone. And they told me the police had besieged the place and firing at people. And my experience and probably what I know, I told them it could not have been the police. Even before I got to know the facts, because I know the police is structured, unlike the national security. And so I told them that, no, it wouldn't be, it's not possible. And in fact, the then director of Ghana Police Operation appeared there and said, no, it's not them. And we saw what happened at the commission. This was a Thursday. One thing I would want to put across to His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, is not to look into the eyes of these traumatized young men, some of them who are still in who can walk and probably not compensate them adequately. Some of them might need clinical psychologists to take them through counseling. So the sound of gunfire, so I didn't need to deck. I believe it was a hitch or a glitch. And so I would, I would continue by asking his, select, his Excellency, the President of the Republic, to compensate this man as captured by the white paper. That is the only way 2020 elections, we might not have reprisal attacks, if anything should happen. But when people begin to feel that if I'm attacked and I don't defend myself, chances are that I never get any compensation, then we, are, we might see something that would be more despicable. The third one has to do with prosecutions. In the white paper, 
it was highlighted that a certain double should be prosecuted and some people should be prosecuted. Unless, of course, I'm missing something, but that I haven't seen or read anywhere that those prosecutions are ongoing. Before the 31st January carnage here, and strangely, anyone who knows the, this constituency, it's supposed to be a middle class constituency, and for uh, reasons that I can't tell, this took place here. And before then, some of us have been talking about national security, and I've said it, and I would repeat it again, that the National Security House outlived its usefulness. It has outlived its usefulness. I would appeal to the president. I would ask that we scrap the national security. Let's clean it with a parazon. Let's restructure it. Because the national security is heading us into probably that doomsday prophecy. And you know, I mean, the story is out there on social media. I didn't put it out there. You know what our national security minister got himself into. Probably that's a tip of the iceberg. And so I would urge that the laws that put together the national security, the national security is doing something else. We have a paramilitary within the national security. They are not supposed to be keeping arms. And I dare say that somewhere last year, was it two years ago, 4,000 shotguns were brought into the country. And I don't know where the shotguns are. I was expecting national security to tell us where the shotguns are. Have they been distributed for hunting? Have they found their way into the hands of people and this could be used? I don't know. I'm only asking questions. And so I would urge that if the president is listening, humbly, the national security is a problem when it comes to the security of this country. I do also want to, probably, a note of caution. We have a certain vigilantism and call it other offenses law, which I call the most bogus law I have ever come across. Because you don't make a law for yourself and hope that you would use the law against yourself. And I'm saying this without any shred of mind, any shred of doubt in my mind. Because if you make such a law, and that law is supposed to be supervised by the executive, and we have RECSEC, we have DISEC, MUSEC, and these are people who, the political party, full soldiers, those who commit the most atrocities, respond to. And you have a certain police that we know that the police service with integrity but not independent means that a police officer might not be able to arrest these hoodlums when they go on rampaging. And so I would urge that, uh, I don't know why that law was passed in parliament, but subsequently, uh, those of us who fail to contribute to it for good reasons can testify to the fact that this law has not been used, nowhere has it been used. And so then probably we are good in formulating laws. The other thing has to do with measures to put in place for 2020 elections. We already have too much tension in the country. And the agitations and counter agitations over the voters register. I would urge caution and ask the feuding parties and ask the referee and probably is it the eminent advisory body also, this time around, headed by uh, his good self, Justice Emily Short. I'm not, I, I want to believe that uh, this time around, it's not going to be a situation like the Commission's report, where what is going to be done would be in favor of Ghanaians, because then uh, it looks like a lot of Ghanaians are asking for one thing, and I'm hoping that the right thing would be done so that. Uh, the tension we are seeing is almost like a precursor for a certain confrontation in 2020 election. And I am here to speak so that the media here would have me on record for admonishing and asking our leaders 
that can we do the right thing so that if anything happens and I'm called to speak, I would say, I told you. I told you would have been probably uh, too late. And so, uh, Your Excellency, the former president, I would urge you to engage the sitting president, uh, probably Jerry John Rawlings, President Kofo is there, you, the past presidents and uh, the leaders of this country, who knows how this country should be run, should probably sit with those who knows who probably are in charge of this country today, so that in the end, what Ghanaians want is either to go to the elections and confirm or uh, vote against. That's all we want. Very simple. And so I would urge that that is done so that uh, the precursor, we are seeing demonstrations and counter demonstration yesterday was something that shouldn't have happened. And so as far as I am concerned, Mr. President, I'm giving 15 minutes and I haven't been sent any note to say I would have to end. So I must as well continue. I must as well continue. I need three more minutes to conclude. Thank you very much. For uh, the beautiful woman is very kind. So she's giving me three more minutes. I would urge that if the white paper, sorry, the Emil Short Commission's work, per the white paper, they deviated. Then I think that since it is our money that was used in putting them together, the president should withdraw the white paper and ask the short commission to redo, give them proper, proper terms and conditions which they would understand. But we all saw what happened on TV. And the short commission's report would have sanitized the security architecture and probably would have helped in doing away with electric, el electoral violence in this country. But unfortunately, I think the executive had a reason to say no, we would reject them. And even the little recommendations that were accepted, unfortunately, have not been implemented. I would want that to be implemented before we go to the polls or else. I have had several people calling me from Yangpanduri, from Salaga, from uh, Sam John's, uh, Sam George's uh, constituency. A lot of people calling me saying that, you see, this time around, we are going to be prepared. And I say, there's nothing. You don't want to. I saw the 97, 90, 1979 coup, despicable. And what we saw, probably. Uh, a similar thing, and anybody who has visited a war zone will tell you these are, you see them in war-torn countries. But we saw them not none other place than this constituency. And therefore, I would want to end by uh, probably asking that we use this occasion to remember the young men, I didn't see any woman, the young men who suffered psychologically and physical injuries and call for adequate compensation and continual support for these people since it is the only way as a country we can forge ahead. We didn't vote. I voted for the 1992 constitution. We didn't vote for the 1992 constitution to experience this kind of carnage. Thank you very much for giving me additional three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Adam Bona. He is a security analyst and he delivered that paper. Our second speaker for the morning is Mr. Kwesi Prajinia, managing editor of the Insight newspaper. Your Excellency John Dramani Mahama, former president, leader of the National Democratic Congress, and presidential candidate of the National Democratic Congress. Nime, comrades and friends. I've come here this morning simply as a Ghanaian. Because I believe that what we are commemorating and what we are discussing is about Ghana and has consequences for every Ghanaian irrespective of our political orientation or affiliation. 
What happened on the 31st of January 2019 can destabilize this country. And if this country is destabilized, whether you are a member of the MPP, the CPP, or some of the parties in coma, it will affect you. One of the things that has brought me here today is the need to sound a warning, and a very, very strong warning. And that warning is that this country is slowly but surely sliding down the path of violence and chaos. And reasonable people, people who love this country, people who believe in democracy and constitutionalism, have a duty to stand up and struggle in order to maintain decency, order, and development for our people. I've been a little under the weather and was hesitating about whether to come here today or not, only to be rudely awakened to the fact that what happens on 31st January 1919 is continuing to happen and that we need to stand up and fight. Yesterday, I saw a post on WhatsApp, which was a directive from the hierarchy of the Ghana Police Service, instructing all police personnel not to provide security for this event. This is the first time in my life, and perhaps the first time in recorded history, that a police institution is calling on policemen not to provide security. Now, if the police is not providing security, what is the police there for? Indeed, what happened yesterday is a continuation on what happened on the 31st of January, 2019. It's a continuation. By announcing that the police was not going to provide security for this event, what was the police service seeking to do? Was the police service not sending a signal to hoodlums that they can come here and do as they please and that the police would not act? Was that not what the police was doing yesterday? In any case, whether we like it or not, President John Dramani Mahama is a president of this country, has been a president of this country before. And he's entitled to the security which is offered former President Kufuo. He's entitled to the same security which is offered former President Jerry John Rawlings and every other person. The police must provide reasons why former President John Dramani Mahama cannot be provided with security when he attends public events like this one. I am totally shocked and disgusted by the conduct of our police service. And indeed, i like to use this opportunity to send a very clear and loud warning to our security services. Our security services should not forget that the people of this country defeat British colonialism at the time when Britain was said to rule the waves. We defeated British colonialism. The people in the security services should not forget what happened in Haiti when under Papa Doc and Baby Doc, they established on Tom Marcuse to terrorize the people. They still drove them out of power. The security services should not forget the fact that the United States of America with all its might was driven out of Vietnam with its tails behind its knees and so on. No security force can stand against the will and determination of the people. And that ultimately, ultimately, the people of this country will take their destiny into their own hands and they will defeat all the negative forces which intend to cause chaos and mayhem in our country. And I can assure them of that. 
There are so many of us who have said that we are praying. We are praying to avoid violence in the election in 2020. It's so all well and good to pray. But we have to understand one thing. The 1992 Constitution enjoins all Ghanaians to do every and anything possible, every and anything possible to protect the Constitution and to protect national sovereignty. So those who believe in prayers, let them pray. Those who belong to the Akunedi Shrine, let them do what the Akunedi Shrine wants them to do. Those who belong to Nakaba, let them do what Nakaba will do. And those who feel strong enough to confront the strength of the useless and wicked, let them gather their strength and face them. That is a duty that the 1992 Constitution imposes on us. The 1992 Constitution is absolutely clear about what we ought to do when national sovereignty is threatened. In any case, I am not as deeply worried as others have said, because I'm convinced that the people of this country have the capacity to resist what is not in their interest, and they will resist what is not in their interest, and they will be victorious. So I'm not worried. But you see, if you watch the events of January 31st, 1919, you cannot, 2019, you cannot ignore the fact that there were stray bullets, stray bullets, stray bullets do not have the capacity to distinguish between who's, who is loyal to MPP and who is loyal to NDC. Stray bullets, they can hit anybody and everybody. So those who are promoting this carelessness should be reminded about the existence of stray bullets and what stray bullets can do. <laughs> Comrades and friends, there are some who say that this event is not worthy of celebration. It's not even worthy of mention. Because there have been other incidents. And they mention uh, Tiwa and other places and so on. I am saying here now that what happened in Ayawasu West War God has never happened in our history. Because the hoodlums came in state vehicles. They came disguised as national security personnel and they were supported by ministers who justified their actions. It's never happened in our history before and this is extraordinary. My worry is that up to today, these hoodlums are still embedded in the national security apparatus. The people who are responsible for your injuries the people who tried to kill the 27 of you here assembled are still being paid by your taxes. That is the worry. Those people are still wearing uniforms procured by the Ghanaian taxpayer. Those people are still acting in our name. And I'd like to emphasize here and now that if the government is serious about preserving the sanity and peace of this country, the first step is to dismantle immediately those outfits of hoodlums in the security service. Let's sanitize the security services and let's throw out the vigilantes from the security services. There's a duty we have to ourselves and to the nation. We need to do that as quickly as possible. I want again to emphasize that the enactment of laws does not automatically resolve problems. The law of vigilantism is absolutely useless and meaningless to the extent that it has not ended vigilanteism and it has not brought to book those responsible for those acts last year. Only a couple of days ago, the member of parliament for Dodo Dio Dio, 
was going to the inauguration of a hospital. He was accosted by vigilante groups. They heckled him. And if good counsel had not prevailed, God knows what would have happened to Neil Ante Van der Poel. That's a manifestation of vigilantism. It is still happening in spite of the law. And we ought to take measures to dismantle all the vestiges of vigilantism and ensure that at the end of the day, the people of Ghana will choose their own leaders. And if at the end of the day, we go through peaceful, credible elections and so on, and the people of Ghana decide that Captain Akamba should become president of Ghana, we will all bow to Captain Akamba and help him rule this country. If at the end of the day, the people of Ghana decide that in spite of everything that is happening today, in spite of everything that is happening today, Nana Dodan Kwakufuado should repeat for more years. But, but if that is the will of the people expressed in true, genuine, transparent elections, we have no option than to accept it. But if at the end of the day, somebody is declared president, and we all know that he came through Kukululu and Wagadre and all of that, then we will exercise our right to resist oppressors' rule until the people's will is established. And there can be no compromise on this one. No compromise on this one. And indeed, all of us, and I mean all of us, irrespective of our political party affiliation and so on, ought to join this campaign to ensure that the true will of the people is expressed and accepted and that we work with the true will of our people. One of the major things threatening our democracy today and casting a shadow of doubt about the outcome of the 2020 elections is the attempt to fabricate a new voters' register. And some of the arguments that have been made simply defy common sense. People make arguments, you look them in the face, and you begin to wonder where common sense has fled to. We are told that the Ghanaian voters register has dead people on it and therefore it is not useful. Show me one country in the world from Afghanistan through India through Pakistan to the United States of America, where you don't have dead people on the register. It's impossible to have a register without dead people. If you finish compiling the register at 12 noon today, by 1 o'clock, somebody will die. There will always be dead people on the register. So that's a bad argument. It's an argument which should not be made. We are being told again, that we need to compile a new voter's register because the machines are faulty. If the machines are faulty, why wipe the whole data? Why don't you simply change the machines? And then they say that, oh, some people, because of the work they do, their fingerprints have been deformed. So we should add facial recognition. As if only fingers can get deformed. What about faces would get deformed? This whole argument is so nonsensical, it doesn't make sense. And unfortunately for us, we have an electoral commission and commissioners who have no shame wearing their, 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 their biases as badges of honor. You have a vice chairman of the commission who can say in public that he hates one particular party, that that one particular party is a danger to democracy. Where does this happen? How can this happen anywhere? So the resistance against the voters' register ought to continue as one of the measures which would ensure that the outcome of the elections would be credible.
But I must sound two notes of caution. What is happening in our country demands total mobilization. Complete and total mobilization of everybody and anybody. This hanky-panky way of organizing resistance, of mobilizing and demobilizing, mobilizing and demobilizing is not in anybody's interest. So those who want to mobilize, let it be mobilization all the way. No demobilization anymore. Now this mobilization and demobilization sends wrong signals. So that is the first question that I like to deliver. Now the second question that I like to deliver is that all of these processes which have begun, demonstrations, press conferences, and so on, somebody must begin to determine the end game. What is the end game? What are the different options open to us? If this does not happen, what should happen? If that happens, what should happen? There has to be a plan. You don't start something until you have a plan for the end. And I don't see that plan for the end. That is the weakness of the mobilization that is taking place. So, let us begin to mobilize. Let us begin to organize. But above all, let us begin to think. And let our actions spring out of thinking. I am confident. I am absolutely confident that on December 7, 2020, the true will of the people of Ghana will be expressed. And no force on earth can change that true will of the people of this country. And I'm this confident because we are all learning our lessons. All of us are learning our lessons. And one big lesson that all of us have learned is that whatever decisions we make today, whatever actions we, we take today, will have consequences for all of us. I recall 2019, no, 2016. I recall 2015, 2016. And I heard some members of the NDC if you don't like what I'm saying, I apologize, but I can't help it. And they were so full of hatred for the flag bearer of the party. So they subverted the flag bearer of the party. Today, January 2020, the flag bearer is sitting here. He came here with a motorcade provided by the state. The constitution guarantees his salary until he will die. He will never suffer if he pulls out of politics. Those people, those big men who finance the opposition, Comrades, 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 comrades. Those big men, those party giants and so on, what is happening to their businesses today? Are they not the people who are today playing hide and seek with the police? So if you don't learn from this experience, it's up to you. And I've heard some people, you've all heard them, and they come to you and say, look, I am the most qualified person to become the vice presidential candidate of the party. If they don't give it to me, they will win. Nonsense. Who are you?
Comrades. Comrades. Comrades and friends. Whether we operate in the CPP, whether we operate in the PNC, whether we operate in the MPP and so on, what makes politics noble is that it's about the people of our, the, our country and their plight and how to change the conditions of the underprivileged. It is not about anybody with a stupid and useless ambition to become anything. It's about our people's access to water. It's about providing better education for our people. It's about building infrastructure, improving national infrastructure. It's about portable water for our people and so on. That is what politics should be about. All these useless, ambitious people who are striding the path and making things difficult, they should get out of our way and let the people move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know you want to hear more, but we'll do that another time. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwesi Pratt, Jr., Managing Editor of the Inside Newspaper. We are grateful for your time. Remember that if you are watching us from home, we are live on Accra FM, Class FM, Power FM, or Ahuto FM. Our third speaker for the morning is our brother, Dr. Abdul Basit Aziz Bamba. He is a lawyer and a lecturer at the University of Ghana, Lagon, and he has also joined us this morning. Thank you very much for your time, Doc.